Anesu Adrian Mupemi is more affectionately known as Jaseed. A founding member of multi-award winning group Bongo Muffin, Jaseed has been able to comfortably exist in Guaido and, most popularly, Raga and Dance Hall. With a career that spans well over 20 years, the musician who was born in Zimbabwe but has lived most of his life in South Africa is a custodian of dance hall in Africa. He definitely deserves his flowers while he can still smell them. I met Jasid at the Old Baseline, which was home to his and the Admiral's weekly event, Raga Nights. He and the Admiral have since taken over the Old Baseline and now call it Newtown Music Factory. In this interview, Jasid talks to me about leaving his construction engineering studies for music, forming Bongo Muffin, the revered Raga Nights, and a whole lot more. So let's go back to the foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, construction engineering. Mm-hmm. What does that even mean? <laughs> construction engineering, that is, uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, the engineering needed to put a construction into into place, mm. you know, starting from uh, uh, taking like going to a bush and say we're going to put a mall here. Okay. Uh, so so it when works hand in hand with architecture. It works hand in hand with the architecture. Actually, the architecture has to come to us with a drawing. The architect is very someone full of fantastical ideas, <laughs> and we have to make sure that. The dream of the architect is uh, is manifested on the ground, okay. and making him under and making him also understand that the ground may not allow some of his fantastical ideas <laughs> to see the night of the, the light of the day, whether the soil is too weak to sustain a building which is maybe two million tons, whatever. So we have to calculate. When you're doing construction engineering, the first uh, thing subject you get involved in is understanding how soil behaves. Something mm-hmm. called soil mechanics, you know, where you have to estimate where you have to uh, uh, estimate things like uh, potential difference, which is the ability of a soil to sustain a load. That's hectic. That's hectic, and, they, and, and that's what you wanted to study. That's what I was. That was I was studying that. And then like. And then, man, the music took over, man. The music took over. I was really enjoying it. I had passed. I had actually passed some of my some of the people I went to school with. had, fl- had, had actually flopped their first year. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time you got to uh, studying construction engineering, mm. had you already been making music? I'd already been making music. You know? okay. I've 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 been DJing from the age of from about the age of thirteen. You know. Really. Yeah, I was DJing from grade six. And, I played Yvonne Chaka Chaka to other kids. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> DJ. <laughs> and they didn't know Yvonne Chaka Chaka. No, I mean, we, we, I, I went to a missionary school mm. uh, in, uh, thing, in, in, in Zim. So we used to have, uh, the primary school used to have an entertainment committee mm. where we would go every week to go buy new music with the sound system. So most of the stuff that was coming from stuff, stuff Africa was the most, was the most dominant, like, you know, thing. External in culture sound. in terms of sound, because Gallo, all these big companies, they used to come and try to take the the Zimbabwean dollar when it was still strong, and <laughs> you know. So I really happened to be like that guy who was outstanding, funny, music, entertaining other kids, always absent-minded because I'm daydreaming. <laughs> But you know the, the 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 music side of it, I think it's something really. I was, I stood out for you know, mm. you know, academics. Yes, I was very good at whatever I was doing. You know? But music still had your heart. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I so much good grades that uh, I had so much good grades at all level that I was actually allowed to come to in, to the college with my O-level grades before I'd even finished my A-level grades. Really? Uh, yeah. So you were super about, smart. I had about six A's. <laughs> That's incredible. So, you know, I was reading somewhere that apparently when you were DJing in the clubs, 
uh, you'd always try and put your own lyrics. In yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, the influence of uh, the Jamaican Caribbean culture. Because mm. I know back in the days they would maybe make a uh, a song with an instrumental. Yes, uh, on CD. Or, or, on, or, or, on, on the vinyl, I'm saying, like, like maybe maybe the the side A is the actual song, side B is the instrumental. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So and also the coming of dub music, so it's really tempted, and it, I think it's it's where the whole DJing chipping over the music came from because back in the days they would uh, put a version, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was doing that for a very long time. And what was the crowd response? Would they be like, that's not how the song goes. Why are you we, messing up the song? It was just the creativity. Because you know that when you are kids and you're experimenting on this thing, there's no, there's no proper, there's no adult intervention to stop you. You're all primary school kids. So I was a DJ from primary to secondary to tertiary to college. Even by the time Oscar saw me. Mm. He saw me in a club here, DJ. In Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe. In, uh, in Bulawe. In Bulawe. Cool. And then he said, we need to come to Johannesburg. Really? Yeah. And that was just based off you That DJing was on me. On just, he just saw me on the mic and said, this is what I'm looking for now. <laughs> <laughs> South Africa needs to hear this now. <laughs> so what was that, what is that called for those of us who aren't into... It's called, uh, that's what the Jamaicans, they call it DJing. Yeah, but when you are on the mic... We are on the mic. The mic MC in Jamaica is called a DJ. Okay. And the guy who plays the music is the selector. Okay. What we call a DJ here in Jamaica is a selector. Ah, uh, I see. I the see. guy on the mic is the one who does the DJing. Okay, mm. cool. All right, so then Oscar sees you and he says, come to South Africa. Yeah. And, and what will... is the plan? Does he say, come to South Africa to do what? To work. <laughs> I've got... Days, I've got something that I need to put together with you. I think in his mind, because he was already in the industry, his travels, it already made him like, you know, uh, seen the likes of uh, Stone and Speedy, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, at that time, Boom Shaka was already a successful group. Oh, and of course they had Junior. Yeah, they had Junior and whatever. Because that was the era of Shaba. You know, mm-hmm. Shaba was the biggest thing in the world. Yeah. So... Shabba, I mean, Junior was doing his Shabba elements in the group. And um, what's his name? Abba from Abba Shanti yeah. was also doing his own thing. But that's a straight bite, isn't it? it like was, from Shabba to Abba. That was, that was uh, what, that's what music is about. You have to know how to steal in a very clever way. Uh, you know, they say Abba. that the, the, best, the best artists are those who are able to steal. You know? They're yeah. still in front of the thing. Yeah. And on TV. So, uh, so when Oscar saw that, no, he could maybe, instead of make, making a, one guy who does dance all, <clears throat> and maybe like how Boom Shaka and then and, and were, let me get a group of three guys. One does rap, one sings, one does the Jamaican thing there. Yeah. And then, yeah, we came to Mzansi, man. I came to Mzansi a, a year later. You know? Yeah. Would I have come through here uh, because of the invitation? It was very doubtful because I was like I was saying I was in the I was in the middle of like really studying, you know, mm. you know. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, must I go? Must I stay? It wasn't as if like you know things in Zim were bad. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The the the, the rent and the Zim dollar was like one one is to one yeah. around that time. So you, you really wanted to be a star in Zim, you know, or yeah. go to, and, and, and uh, South Africa. And I think apparently around that time also, the excitement also of uh, South Africa getting this freedom. Mm. But otherwise, uh, before 1994, because I'm talking of uh, Oscar seeing me in 1995, okay. you know. So prior to that, South Africa was not I'm like, a, <laughs> was not a place to be. It was like, yo... Because, I mean, the, the, the same visuals you see of bad things happening to African people, I mean, like, you know, whether, yeah. they, whether it is in Kenya or it is in Ethiopia and whatever, there were also those visuals coming of, like, you know, African people getting beaten up by, you know? Mm. It's like shizzle, 
you know, where where is my place there? Where Africa are yeah. getting beaten? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, that excitement of uh, Mandela coming out of prison and all those things, new South Africa, it really encompassed the whole region. The whole region really was celebrating because you know we used to see South Africa like really, you know, we're talking of what Zimbabwe having independence independence for 14 years. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So what was it that eventually made you say, okay, cool, I'll come? My mother passed away in about 1996. Mm. You know, because she was like the cornerstone of the family. Mm. Was she gonna allow me to come and do music? In the middle of me doing construction and engineering, mm. she had high hopes of me to go and build and build an oil rig somewhere in the coast of New Zealand or somewhere out there. Yeah. That's where that's all. That's what she had, she had pegged for me. And then I'd say, you know what? You know, the cornerstone of the family is gone now. What must I do? I had to take a plunge to come to South Africa and say, boom, let's and then go for it. became a legend. Hey, you see that. <laughs> <laughs> so when you met Stone and, and Speedy, what was the initial? Uh, I don't want to say chemistry because I don't know if there was chemistry. They were all was skinny. Stone. stone was skinny. <laughs> Speedy was. I think Stone was even twice as skinny. Yeah. Uh, Speedy was just full of excitement. Mm. Uh, that's that's one thing I really do, do remember, you know. And uh, I think we made our first song the first time we met, you know. Mm. The summertime, well, the summertime yeah. yeah, you know, because that time there were there were no laptops one or the other, so the music was mainly was mainly right. on the keyboard. Yeah, you know, guys would program, you know, they were programmable keyboards, you know. Mm. So they made the first rhythm, Bruce Spitler, made made that tune there, and we were just voicing. By the time we went in the studio, we had our first song, man. Nice. Yeah. So you instantly clicked. We instantly clicked. We instantly clicked, and trust me, out of the three of us, and and Tanisco, she was very, very. She was she was still very young, you know. Mm. You know? And I, I even remember <clears throat> the first time Oscar came to us and started saying to us guys, you know, this girl, you know, yeah, you know, she's done most of your backings in your in you know in your recordings. Don't you want it? We part and parcel of your of your band. She was so small and so, and, and, and so cute. Yeah. So and what did you say? Were you like, no, she's no, too small. No, we were saying, I know it's cool, man. We were saying, no, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. And because uh, she, 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 she also, she was there at the beginning of the, you know, of the band, but not being a full member, mm -hmm. just adding ad libs. Yeah. But you never know, Oscar maybe knew that, because I think Oscar had a, had, had a more understanding of the industry because he was there already, mm -hmm. you know. So... And I think he fa he had fallen in love with Tanisco's voice on uh, a tune called uh, Jackknife. Mm. That tune there, you know? Yeah. That's where Oscar had really found Tanisco there. So yeah, came so, together yeah. and then around the same time, I'm now in South Africa. I'm coming from Zimbabwe, where reggae was like on a different level. Yeah. I'm coming to South Africa, and I was hoping that maybe the guys like uh, like Junior and Wawa, wow, wow, they understood the 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 playing of reggae itself. You know, in terms of like more than just the uh, the recording part of it, because because uh, with with the reggae, there's the, there's the artist, and then there's those DJ outfits now called sound systems. Mm. You know. Whether you can be a, you can be a, you can you can be an individual DJ with your own name, but playing your your, your reggae cuts one or the other. I'm coming in the country. There isn't anything of that sort, mm. you know. And Andy is over at Voice of Soweto. Andy is over at Voice of Soweto. One friend of mine who was a rastaman from Cape Town called Teba Shumba, who mm. was also from in, Scheme at the time. From Scheme for that time, man, end up joining forces to. You know, out of out of speed and stone, I think I found more home in pairing with Teba. Cause Stone was staying in Vona Valley. Mm -hmm. Speedy, Speedy was like you know house. You know he was like a house house hopping. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was house hoping today is with Julia days. What what what? You know. Yeah. Uh, and the guy I've, I've I really 
was able to start like you know really speaking more reggae with was that guy Teba. Mm. And then and then when I met Andy, the worlds also clicked because yeah. he was coming from England and understanding where reggae was and where and coming from Zimbabwe, it felt like we were reading the same chapter. Yeah. You know? So he said that when when you came uh I don't know if you came for an interview. To, to, to the voice of Soweto, yeah. Yes. Mm. And he said you guys ended up... Uh, yeah, having a small little sound class because yes. I'd, got, I'd gotten music. I, I, I'd gotten music. And uh, the funny enough part of the whole thing is like uh, uh, this... Uh, f- when, while I was doing construction engineering, you know what I'm saying, DJing at, uh, at, uh, at, at, the, local, at the local clubs in Bolueo, mm. one of the guys who was studying there was a, a, a footballer called Makwinji Somapiri. He even played in the Premier League. Say to me, I must introduce you to, to Peter Ndlov. Mm. Peter Ndlov was already playing for the Barclays Premier League in England. So it was like, really? So yeah, Peter listens to dance only. <laughs> you know? So he, he's the one who introduced me to Peter. And then Peter was just gladly enough to make use of some of his music. Yeah. That gave me the full name of being a fully fledged DJ in Blue Air. And I even came with some of the music to South Africa. So he just so gave it to me. There was no there was no seed, he copied us around that time. You know? Oh that's trust. Yeah. That means you were really doing your yeah. thing. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So he I ended up bring some of the stuff here to South Africa and when I met Andy, you know? Because that time it was about when you see somebody coming there with CDs that you don't have, you don't have those CDs. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like when you when someone shows you a CD and you think maybe I've got a USB. No, around that time, if you didn't you have the have CD, you don't have the CD. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, Andy, I met I met up with Andy, you know, mm. and uh, we, we we sized up each other, you know, on on on, on the first night. On the first show, mm-hmm. you know, I had some very latest tunes because we all knew that that kind of music was difficult to get hold of. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we ended up having a sparring session, sparring session. And then I said, you know what, you and I must form a thing, a sound system, you know? Mm-hmm. And he was doubting it. Why he was already. Because he had already tried to play at some clubs, you know, in Papita and Wawa to four or five people. Mm. You know, but I think it didn't kick off as much as he was expecting it to. Mm. So he was on some, hey man, he even came to a place where I was, I was playing in, in Yorville for about five, six people there, you know, yeah. saying, yeah, no, nice one, nice one, nice one. But I kept on pressing, I said, Andy, if there's anyone I'm gonna, if there's anyone who understands dance all right now where we are, you are the guy, and uh, let's work with this thing together and then next thing the idea of south africa being free as a white guy and a black guy they are all playing reggae music it took people by surprise but when they saw when they saw what we were doing there before you knew it within six months we were pulling one thousand two thousand people wow. a thing in in, in rocky street mm. you know the places that used to happen the Bapita as and what what that was the era of, of the gong before you knew it, we were now hosting the biggest weekly party in thing in Rocky Street. And what was it called at the time? Uh, we, we 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 tried to call ourselves I mean the the Mandela Sound System. <laughs> you know, the first time and there was names like you know what you guys, you can't just use Mandela's name. You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We'd even cut some dub plates. I mean here and there, yeah. Mandela Mandela Sound, whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But uh. Around the time, you know, so many things were happening. That's when so many guys also came into onto the scene looking for jobs. Mm-hmm. I remember Bad Boy T and them like walking the streets of Yoga, Fresh and them also. You know that what I was away before YFM yeah. was even it even moved to the to bedrooms. Mm-hmm. So so many talented people were all conglom you know conglomerating around this area. The yeah. likes of Azania, the likes of what what. People all coming bright eyed, young, and willing to just contribute to the exciting light, nightlife yeah. of things, you know? 
So yeah, we, we stood out, we stood the test of time in, in Yorville to a point of whereby even after Andy left uh, the voice of Soweto, which became YFM, mm. his show did not continue. But because most of the YFM DJs used to come to hear us play on the streets, mm. we were brought into the to the day. To the DJ Y. Pan, at Y. So, nice. yeah. so how yeah. did you then become African Storm Sound System? African Storm Sound System, that's the name that we chose, I think, along the development of saying, you know what, we're going to have to have a, a sound system name in terms of the tradition of uh, the likes of uh, the big Jamaican sound system, the yeah. big Japanese sound systems, you know. And African Storm, you know, took, a, you know, took, its, took its own life and then you 20 years later we're here. Yeah. Huh? You even put out a compilation a few years ago? Well, a few years ago, compilations here and there, here and there, you know? Yeah. So in your duo as African Sound System, uh-huh. Andy is the selector and you are the DJ, uh-huh. according to the experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. So I also wanted to meet you here because apparently you have a studio here. We are the new management of this building now. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, because... Uh, we were here for about seven years. With the studio? With the, uh, with, with, no, with just our, our, our normal regular nights. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was an automatic thing of saying that when the, when the other tenant wanted to leave, you know, we had built a seven year repetition of being mm-hmm. in the venue and one or the other. And, uh, and, and our night really was the one that was like really sustaining the movement. Yeah. You know, towards the end of the the, the 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 baseline life, our night became like you know the breadwinner yeah. for the venue. Were well, we gonna close because the guy, the gentleman, was, was was gonna go? No, we decided to like you know find ways and means of uh, continuing with uh, the tradition of keeping the Thursday nights alive. Yeah. So the thing about Raga nights for me is, you would think that. It's a niche thing, right? Uh-huh. Because especially in this country, uh-huh. dance hall uh-huh. and uh-huh. reggae uh-huh. is not mainstream. Uh-huh. But everybody goes to Raga. Everybody goes to Raga. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, yeah. you, yeah, you can, you can find Unati or Glenn Lewis yeah. in the party. You won't tell you that he was there. You just go, yo, I was <laughs> at your place yesterday. So really glad to say, yeah, you know. Because the times I've been, it's been packed. Really? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, how do you think you're managing to keep people who are not necessarily just reggae and dancehall fans coming to Raga Nights? How uh, are we managing to do it, man? Mm. I think it's like a, we, like I was saying, I mean, I've, I've been doing this thing for a long time. So, I think uh, because you, you keep on wanting to try to do things that you have never done before, you know, in terms of presentation, you know. Mm. We try by all means to keep the presentation up there, the lighting, the sound system. We don't compromise with sound system. Mm. We don't compromise on trying to get the, the guys who, who do the lighting and everything. So instead of it being your regular night out at Moloko or Club Cubana or whatever and everything, yeah. you have that semi-club, semi concert experience yeah. in the middle of the week yeah. and I think for the fanatics of music I think uh, they see it I'm sure as a presentation worth coming to see over and over again and we are not playing around when we are dropping those big tunes we don't because I mean you know dance or music you know, it's got that, it's got that, uh, I mean, what can I say, man? The roots of the, the roots of dance of uh, my music, I think, resonate with a lot of people, you mm-hmm. know? You know, it's big in Germany, it's big in London, it's big in Japan, and it's an, it's an, it's, it's a, it's an African creativity. Mm. So, which means it must make, it must have home. It must have roots here at home. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, it's part of the BET in it, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the energy, you know, the Jamaicans and the what, the elements. Yeah. The, ele- the elements are, are, are very pro, I mean, what can I say, pro-African. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so it definitely has found itself home here. And by the end of the day, we are individuals who thrive to give people a good presentation. Yeah. Year in and year out. Some of the biggest consumers of reggae is France, Germany, and Japan. The biggest consumers of reggae. But even, um, I don't know if you saw that documentary about the, the girls in Japan. Who yeah, to be yeah, they're good. Jama- they're good. There's, there's a very strong uh, Jamaican Japanese cross cultural exchange. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about 100,000 people. And those girls have yeah, were, yeah, they they would even dance or queens who yeah. went to Jamaica to contest and win. Wow. Yeah, yeah. the dance or queens man, cause uh, with <coughs> with every sound, I mean, like as you are seeing with a uh, with a house and uh, how even if you look at the history of a, uh, an artist like Lebo Matosa, mm. you know, when she came on the scene. When uh, when Boomsaka came on the scene, they were actually emulating what Patra was doing. Mm. You know, like they had the, yeah, hair, they had, they had the, the whole shorts. Patra, they had the whole Patra thing that was going on there, and it's all coming from the idea of a, uh, you know, I think parting can they can never be a party without the 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 ladies. Mm. You know what I'm saying, and. Uh, Ladies are always the stars of the night, you know. So I think it comes from that element of saying, "Who is the lady who can dance the most?" You know, in the in the night, and I think that's where the tradition of like dance or queens coming out, saying, "No, oh, you are the queen of the thing." And yeah. and in Jamaica, they live from there. Competitions came on, you know, and it's, it's within the traditions of just like. What reggae does, you know what I'm saying? It makes you wanna move your waistline. Don't lose yourself, yeah. but lose your waistline <laughs> if you feel like. <laughs> yeah. You know? So do you, because um, I mean, Andy went on to be, like to mark his own territory in film. Mm. And you have like stayed consistent in yeah. uh, the art of music. Yeah. I mean, you, you want a Sama, right? For no reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. for you, what has kept you making music and putting that as the star of the show as opposed to going into like being a sneakerhead uh, or whatever when uh uh i think the the love of entertaining people with reggae mm-hmm. yeah is my drive my drive is like under love of entertaining people with the reggae with with music slash reggae, I love to entertain people with music, and within the within the bigger bracket of music, the one that I use as a weapon the most is reggae. You know what I'm saying? I love music. I think music is one of those energies that uh, has really defined my journey of life. You know, just like maybe some people find find uh, they define their life by sports or by being a Formula One driver or by being a, a footballer. I think for me that energy of music, what it does to me, first and foremost, I feel like I want to share it with the world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And in, in, and in me wanting to share that passion of music, that passion I have of music with the world, is what keeps on making me recruit fishers of sound. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, it's it's really that part of us men that keeps on wanting to find find room even at a time where the music industry has changed. Mm. And it's it's much more <clears throat> is it much more easier now? Is it was it much more difficult then? Some say it was easier back then, yeah. but we had to do door-to-door campaign. Like Bongo Buffin, I think some of the people that don't know us, they don't know us through social media because mm. they know us doing door-to-door campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Going to the people. Yeah, going to the people. And then you flip it uh, 15 years later or 20 years later, you can just post your, post your music and your video and 
people now know you, all kind of things. Like. So there's all those elements that you have to keep on, like you know, bending with the river mm -hmm. and finding your way through. Yeah, I haven't found something that officially explains why you went from apple seed to, to jar seed. seed. So maybe first explain how you became apple seed and why it then changed. Apple seed. I gave my myself that name, you know. When I read the story of this guy called Johnny Appleseed, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very it's, it's a it's a famous folk folk story of uh, the guy who discovered I mean like apples. I think back in the days people used to eat fruits by trial and error. You know, yeah. if you eat something and die, this day, don't eat that <laughs> thing. <there. laughs> yeah. So I think apples. I mean Johnny Appleseed. I think he really. I know I discovered that the apples are really good for you. Yeah. So you went you went all over the world. You went all over the world planting uh you know, apple trees or wherever you used to go, you used to move with these apple seeds and you know, giving it to the people. So that story is like wow. There's people who can do that, who can sacrifice their life to to provide something good to the world, you know? Yeah. Besides yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Because, because I think Johnny Apple said I think from 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 the way that he must have traveled, from from all the stories told, it looks like he traveled all over the world. <laughs> Jesus only was did his story in Jerusalem <laughs> and Bethlehem, <laughs> and, you know. And there we are still eating apples today. So you know, it's it became more like a a metaphorical uh, journey of me just sharing the good seeds of reggae music. Yeah. And then when I went to London, some would say that I know what here in London here. Most of these apples around here, they're all rotten because <laughs> the weather here doesn't they doesn't promote good apples. Yeah. The good apples are from the savannah region. So when you are here, you are jar seed. You oh, know? <laughs> that's how you became jar seed. <laughs> that's when I became jar seed. Because most apples in London, they're already rotten, you know? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So you got deported in 2002. Yeah, boy. And people were upset about that. <laughs> so, what made you come back to South Africa? Because you could have decided then, uh, like, actually, I'm going to go live somewhere the, else. The mission was not over. Mm. The mission was not over, man. What is the mission? The mission, just to, like, you know, uh, keep on spreading the good music of reggae, man. You know? Because Im imagine how much we were ahead of, we were ahead with reggae music in the 90s. Mm. And it's only now that you're starting to find elements of reggae yeah. in the new youth culture now. Like your, your hip hop, your what what, everybody's on some why I say, you know, shata, top shata, the raga, 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 raga. Yeah. People are, you know, so uh, it's how we, for me, it was, it was a thing of just, you know, because reggae, if, if you understand the history of, you still South Africa and reggae. Reggae was one that voice that was that was supposed to be conscientized in the people, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of uh, uh, the revolutionary mo movements that were taking place. That is why even in Zimbabwe, between the people that were invited to come to the Zimbabwean independence, it was either going to be Bob Marley or Jimmy Cliff, mm -hmm. you know in terms of the revolutionary sound around the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. Reggae felt like it was representing Africans and the struggles that they were going through, you know what I'm saying? So to just put that music in the wardrobe, say, I know we're free now, let's, <laughs> you know, let's do other things. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's not something that you know, I, I feel like you know, should be allowed to happen. You know, especially in you know in South Africa, where we know that there's still so many wars, uh, I mean, to so many battles to overcome. Mm. If reggae music can still be there, also being used as a medium, as a voice, to to bring consci consciousness, to remind people where we're coming from, because it's good to it's good to forgive and forget. Yeah. But it's, it's for good to always remember what is it that we must forget. <laughs> deep. That's very deep. You think so? <laughs> and I think that's a great way to end this interview. 
Is there anything else that you feel like we should have discussed? No, man. I think you've checked everything. You know, I must just. I think uh, maybe the next the next movement now is to see reggae on the mainstream. Mm. On the mainstream, um, uh, what I call, on the mainstream channels like your your SABC radio station. Mm. When that when, when that happens, when that happens, then reggae is home. You know, yeah. then reggae is home now. You know, because it, it is that it really it 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 is part of the music industry. You know, just like R and B is part of the music industry, house, whatever. Yeah. I think the the programmers, the radio people, they, they need to bring reggae as part of the, you know, of the music industry. Yeah. You know? Somebody said to me, no, you know, but you know, reggae, when people, uh, people do ganja a lot in reggae parties, and then someone said, no, man, but we're talking about ganja, ganja is nothing. Do you know how many hard drugs people do at house parties? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or in general. Or well, in, in general, do you know how much hard drugs it make? It will make reggae look like you are a thing. You're, you're wasting time. You're wasting people's time. <laughs> you're wasting people's lungs. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So you know it's one of those things, man. Whereby eventually, and now that is free to smoke reggae in the privacy of your of your own reggae. house. You know, most <laughs> reggae most reggae people are they come from the Christian background. So if you're if you are free to smoke in your own house, what if the world is your father's house? You might as well smoke everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed talking to Jasid, and that was just a morsel of his music journey. Once the coronavirus pandemic is a thing of the past, I hope to sit down with him again, maybe even with you guys, to hear the rest of his story. Until then, here are your flowers, Jasid. You're a trailblazer, a pan-Africanist, and a key component of black music culture. I hope you feel the love. My name is Helen Harimbi, and this has been a very special edition of Imbali.